Now, let's start off in Europe, where French prosecutors have charged an 18-year-old student with three counts of attempted murder following a violent incident at a school earlier this week. The student, who allegedly stabbed a school teacher, now faces charges for attempting to kill three individuals, the teacher and two fellow students. Public prosecutor uh, Eric Bullard confirmed the indictment and stated that the suspect has been remanded in custody, citing his intention to kill. This incident is part of a troubling trend in France, where recent years have seen a series of attacks on teachers and students by their peers. However, prosecutors have ruled out any religious or radical motive in this case. They report that the suspect has expressed feelings of unhappiness. C'est terminé ce matin. Il a été présenté à un juge d'instruction qui l'a mis en examen pour trois tentatives d'assassinat sur son enseignante et sur deux élèves parce qu'il revendique une intention de tuer et parce qu'il précise que c'était pour lui le moyen de mettre fin à une pression qu'il ressentait, euh, qu'il avait envie aussi de savoir ce que c'était que de tuer quelqu'un. Il a aussi été, euh, c'est un peu plus accessoire, mais c'est quand même peut-être aussi un rappel de la réglementation qui n'est pas inutile, était mis en examen pour l'introduction d'une arme dans un établissement scolaire. Et euh, la conférence de presse a commencé avec un peu de retard, parce que j'attendais la décision du juge des libertés et de la détention, qui vient de le placer en détention provisoire dans le cadre d'un mandat de dépôt criminel. Il avait l'intention de s'en prendre à une enseignante parce que, euh, et, et peut-être euh, la, la, la réponse euh, qu'il fait euh, peut aussi euh, euh, nous interroger au regard de, de nos pratiques et de l'actualité et du traitement de l'actualité, parce qu'aujourd'hui, si on veut que ça se sache, eh bien, euh, un enseignant, c'est pas mal. Voilà, c'est un, un, un peu ça. Et donc, il avait l'intention aussi que son acte se sache, mais il n'excluait pas, et c'est ce qu'il va faire dans son plan, d'ailleurs, dans une foulée, de s'en prendre. The United Kingdom is gearing up for a crucial general election as the country emerges from recession with the fastest growth in two years. Voters are heading to the polls on July 4th to elect a new government, and the stakes are high. The election comes at a pivotal moment as the UK seeks to revitalize its economy and address pressing issues such as healthcare, education, and national security. The incumbent Conservative Party led by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, is facing stiff competition from the Labour Party, led by Khmer Starmer. Now, the Liberal Democrats, Greens and other parties are also vying for seats in Parliament. Key campaign issues include economic growth, public spending and the country's future relationship with Europe. The election outcome is expected to shape the UK's political landscape for years to come. Joining me on the news to discuss the forthcoming elections in the United Kingdom is a political commentator, Nathaniel Oguni. Thank you for joining me on the news. Now, how is the UK's emergence from recession expected to shape voter priorities and also influence their decision-making process in the upcoming polls? The UK has just come out of recession. Um, we had a short, sharp recession from the end of last year to earlier this year. The economy is now particularly grow by about 1% this year, um, which is of course better than the session, but not quite as good as the government would prefer. Um, I think you'll find a lot of voters are unhappy with the government's economic performance, but there is good news on the horizon. Interest rates, which determine the rates that people pay for their mortgages, are set to come down. Um, economic growth is set to pick up. And the Conservative Party has a strong record on employment since they came into office in 2010. There are 4 million more jobs uh, than there were before. So I think there is good news on the economy. It's just yet to filter through. Now, in the wake of the recession, do you anticipate that voters will place a higher priority on economic security compared to other issues, such as uh, social justice, environmental concerns, or even national security? So national security will definitely be a uh, big theme particularly in the wake of war in Europe. War in Ukraine, I think, has shaped a lot of minds and made people focus more on defence and security issues. But the economy continues to be an important part. Um, the UK has a very strong financial services sector. Indeed, we're top in the world for some parts of financial services, including insurance and foreign exchange trading. There are other areas of the economy, including
including tech, which the UK is quite strong at. The UK has more billion dollar tech firms than anywhere else in Europe, right? And so that's important for the economy. Now, how are the ongoing conflict, of course, uh, in Ukraine and the rising global tensions likely to affect the election discourse surrounding defense and security, particularly for the UK? So the Conservative Party have traditionally been strong on defense. The Conservative Party has traditionally polled better. If you ask people who do you trust more to keep our country safe, the Conservative Party have always polled better. Um, and the Conservative record in government on defence is quite strong. The Conservative Party have taken defence spending to £55 billion, so £55 billion, which is the highest level it's ever been. Um, they're raising it to 2.5% of GDP, which is far above the target um, set by NATO, but it's far above the level spent by many similar European countries. Equally, the United Kingdom has a defence pact with Australia and with the United States, so we collaborate with Australia and the United States to build defence submarines, and that, of course, brings British jobs and things like that. Um, so the Conservative Party, you know, have a strong record on defence. Um, equally, the Labour Party are trying to trying to get their message out. The Le Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, spoke on Monday, which was a bank holiday in the UK. But he spoke on Monday about defence and security, saying that Labour will hold a security review if they were to be elected. But the difficulty with that is the review after an election doesn't tell us what you'd like to do. And so it's difficult to ask people to vote for you if you don't tell them what you'd actually like to do or how you keep them safe. You contrast that with the Conservative Party, the Conservative Minister for Veterans right now, the member of the Cabinet, John Nasser, and he's made some strong announcements on defence for veterans, including 70 million for veteran healthcare and for veteran skills, helping them get jobs after they've left the military. So you have to contrast the two. Now, let's talk about voter demographics here, such as age and location. I mean, do you think this will shape uh, attitudes towards the economic policies and also pol uh, political loyalty? Yes, of course. So let's start with age, for instance. Age is a big factor in elections. Traditionally, in the UK, the older you get, the more likely you are to vote for the Conservative Party. So it often starts that people, when they're young, vote for the Labour Party or other smaller parties, and as they get older, they lean more towards the Conservatives. Um, some say that's because the Conservatives tend to favour lower taxes, and of course, the older you get, the more you're likely to pay taxes. Um, so that's been a big factor. Equally, now we see that the Labour Party have announced that they would like to extend the voting age to 16. So they would allow 16 and 17-year-olds to vote in general elections, which has never been done in the UK before. Um, the Conservative Party have talked about national service, so ensuring that 18-year-olds either spend some time in the military or volunteering in civil resilience. Okay, now uh, what impact do you anticipate this election in terms of outcome will have you know, on the UK's defence and security relationships, particularly with European partners, the US and uh, all of its uh, other allies? So our strong relationship with the United States is likely to continue no matter who's in government. But the important thing to note is that the Conservative Party government has had closer relationships with the Republicans, generally speaking. And so you look at a Republican president, we're likely to have Donald Trump in the White House. If you look at a Republican president like him, you're likely to work better with a Conservative leader in Westminster, the UK, rather than a Labour one. That said, either party is likely to, likely to have strong relationships. And then we look at the EU, for instance, the EU are undergoing their own elections. So the EU will have a uh, European Parliament election, and that will lead to a new European Parliament, as well as new senior ministers within the European Union. They will be looking to have a strong defence relationship with the UK. But for the UK, the UK has often spent more on defence than many of its European countries. Um, including Germany, including France. And so I think the UK will be encouraging them to keep up with its, its defence spending. Nathaniel Oguni, thank you so much for your time on the news. Of course, please. All right. Now, Sweden has announced a pledge of a 13.3 billion krono, equivalent to $1.25 billion in military aid to Ukraine. This comes as Kyiv faces ongoing challenges 
in its conflict with Russia, with vital Western military support experiencing delays. The Scandinavian nation, which officially joined NATO in March, has committed to providing a variety of military supplies to Ukraine, which includes ASC-890 surveillance aircraft, RB-99 medium-range air-to-air missiles, artillery ammunition and its entire fleet of PBV-302 armored attract personnel carriers. Sweden's support for Ukraine extends beyond military aid in recent days. The country has also announced a 650 million chrono aid package to bolster Ukraine's energy supply, which has been targeted by Russian attacks. Additionally, Sweden has pledged a comprehensive civilian and military aid package totaling 75 billion chrono over three years, from 2024 to 2026, to provide ongoing support to Kyiv. Jag ser det inte uttalat några begränsningar eller förbehåll om hur Ukraina får använda svensk material som har blivit donerad till Ukraina. Annat än att de ska användas i enlighet med den internationella humanitära rätten. Och enligt folkrätten så är Ukrainas bekämpande av militära mål på Rysslands territorium legitimt. Vad gäller Johan Flodeus som sitter godtyckligt frihetsberövad av de, de iranska myndigheterna så arbetar den svenska regeringen oförtrutet på att få honom frisläppt så att han så fort som möjligt kan återförenas med sin familj. Och givet de ogrundade anklagelser som har presenterats i hans fall så är det... Thousands of persons have taken to the streets to protest a controversial new law passed by the ruling party in Georgia. Crowds gathered outside the parliament building in Belitsi that uh, after ruling party members of parliament adopted the contentious foreign influence law. In a decisive vote, lawmakers passed the bill by 84 to 4, overriding the veto from a pro-EU president. Proud to the vote, most opposition MPs walked out of the 150-seat chamber in protest. This move comes despite a presidential veto and strong warnings from Western nations that it could jeopardize Georgia's path to the European Union membership. As tensions continue to rise, demonstrators are calling for the government to reconsider the law, which they argue undermines democratic principles and the country's future in the EU. <laughs> In in Southern America, Venezuela has withdrawn its invitation to the European Union to observe the country's upcoming presidential poll in July in a surprising turn of events. Elvis Amoroso, the head of Venezuela's Electoral Council, announced the decision stating it would be immoral to allow the EU mission to observe the elections, citing the bloc's alleged neo-colonialist and interventionist practices against Venezuela. Venezuela has accused the EU of imposing interventionist sanctions, uh, which they claim interfere with the country's sovereignty. Meanwhile, the EU delegation in Venezuela has expressed deep regret over what they called a unilateral decision and urged the National Electoral Council to reconsider, emphasizing the importance of international observers and in ensuring fair and transparent elections. Back in March, Caracas had invited the EU to send an observer team for the July 28th elections, in which President Nicolas Maduro is seeking a third term. His main rival, however, has been disqualified from running. The power electoral of the Republic of Venezuela revoca y deja sin efecto la invitación que extendió a la Unión Europea para que participe a través de de una misión de veeduría electoral en las elecciones del cargo de presidente de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela. Decisión adoptada en ejercicio de nuestra soberanía e intereses del pueblo. Let's go on a quick break. When we return, we have more stories. Stay with us.
In Central America, tensions escalate in Nicaragua as President Daniel Ortega accuses his brother, Humberto Ortega, of treason. This accusation comes at misclaims that Humberto Ortega, former army chief, currently under house arrest, as reported by exiled opponents, committed a grave national offense by awarding a U.S. military of officer in 1992. Speaking in a televised address, President Ortega condemned the act, labeling it as a betrayal of the state's integrity. He emphasized that bestowing such a significant medal upon a U.S. military officer constitutes an act of surrender and treason against the nation. The president's accusation comes against his brother, underscores the deep divisions within Nicaraguan society and the political tension that continues to simmer. Inconcebible action se califica como vergüenza nacional al entregar a un militar yanqui una medalla de tanta relevancia y trascendencia y evidentemente constituye un acto de entreguismo y traición a la patria. El jefe del ejército ya tenía entregada su alma al diablo. Que invalidar esa entrega también borra la afrenta que se cometió. In the Middle East, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has lashed out at the United Nations, calling for actions from the Islamic world following the recent deadly Israeli strikes in Gaza. The president delivered a scattering critic of the United Nations, accusing the organization of failing to uphold its principles in Gaza, he lamented the loss of lives recorded in Gaza, and criticized the UN for its inability to protect even its staff in the region. The president's remarks comes in the wake of a United Nations Security Council meeting convened to address the Israeli attack on a displacement camp near Rafah, which claimed the lives of 21 persons according to officials in Gaza. The Turkish leader condemned the attack and urged swift action to prevent further bloodshed. In his speech, the president also called out fellow Muslim-majority nations for their perceived inaction in response to the Israeli attacks. He urged solidarity and collective action to confront the escalating crisis in Gaza. <laughs> Bu soykırımdan sen de en az İsrail kadar sorumlusun. Ey Avrupa'nın devlet ve hükümet başkanları, İsrail'in bu soykırımına, bu barbarlığına, bu vampirliğine siz de ortak oldunuz. Çünkü sustunuz. Hastane, okul, cami vurdular, sustunuz. Yardım konvoyu vurdular, sustunuz. 21. yüzyılda Canlı yayınla tüm insanlığın izlediği bir soykırımı durduramayacaksan sen ne işe yararsın? Eğer dünyanın geleceği beş ülkenin keyfine kaldıysa ne gerek var o devasa binalara? O kadar harcamaya, o kadar insanı çalıştırmaya. Bırakınız soykırımı durdurmayı. Birleşmiş Milletler kendi personelini... In the meantime, Palestinian human rights and civil organizations have issued a joint plea to the United Nations and the Palestinian Authority, urging them to declare the Gaza Strip a famine-stricken area. During a press conference held on Wednesday, the organization painted a dare picture of the situation in Gaza, citing widespread environmental pollution, the spread of diseases, and the looming famine as major concerns. The groups further accused uh, Israeli forces of attempting to cover up evidence of alleged crimes committed in the region. They called for urgent international intervention to address the humanitarian crisis unfolding in Gaza. The plea from Palestinian NGOs underscores the severity of the situation in Gaza and the urgent need for action to alleviate the suffering of its people. <laughs> فلسطينية بالإعلان الفوري عن قطاع غزة كمنطقة منقوبة بالمجاعة والتلوث البيئي وانتشار الأمراض يجب على الأمم المتحدة والسلطة الفلسطينية تبني هذا الإعلان 
المجاعة ليست موضوع فني وأن أراد طرف أن يثبت أن ليس هناك مجاعة في غزة فليتفضل وليرسل طواقمه الميدانية ويحصل على المعلومات لتظهر ليس فقط حجم المجاعة أيضا التي تم إحداثها حجم الجميريمة بحق السكان في غزة ما قامت به إسرائيل Let's also tell you that Yemen's Houthi rebels, backed by Iran, have claimed responsibility for an attack on a Greek cargo ship, the Lax, along, the several, along with several other vessels. Now, this comes in response to recent Israeli airstrikes in the Palestinian city of Rafah and Gaza. The Mashal Inlet Islands have flagged Greek-operated Lax reportedly sustained damage from three missiles on Tuesday according to U.S. military and maritime security sources. The Houthi have been targeting ships in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden since November. They claim these attacks are in support of Palestinians facing conflict with Israel's military in Gaza. These attacks by the Houthis have further forced some shipping companies to reroute their vessels around South Africa significantly, increasing journey times to avoid the critical Red Sea route which carries roughly 12% of the world's traded goods. And that's a wrap on the news at this time. Don't forget to send in your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. You can also follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live across these platforms. DSTV Channel 422, Star Times, Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Dagbo. Digboy. Bye for now.